In this video, we'll take a look at some of the standard level content from the integration of body systems topic, and we'll take a deeper dive into nervous system integration. Now, when we say integration, what we really mean is coordination and communication, okay? So this could happen between two cells in a tissue. It could happen between two tissues inside of an organ. It could happen between two organ systems. So we need to be thinking about multiple levels of coordination and communication. So let's just make sure that we're clear on these multiple levels of organization. So I have these arranged in order of ascending size. So what that means is that within a cell, I'm going to have multiple organelles and I'm going to have multiple cells working together to form a tissue several types of tissue to make an organ, several organs in an organ system, and then an organism will be made of multiple organ systems. And we'll work on some formal definitions for some of these levels of organization. So when I say tissue, what I mean is a group of two or more different cell types that are working together for a common purpose. They're communicating and coordinating together. So for example, here I have a picture of the alveolus in the lung, and I'm going to find type 1 pneumocytes and type 2 pneumocytes. So those are two types of cells, but we consider them to be the same tissue. This is your alveolus tissue because they're coordinating and working together. Similarly, an organ is going to be two types of tissues working together. So in talking about this lung, we have our alveolar tissue, which we just looked at, but then you also have cartilage tissue and lots of other types of tissue that make up an organ, okay, called your lungs. Plants also have organs. So if I think about a leaf, a leaf has a palisade mesophyll tissue and a spongy mesophyll, tish, uh, spongy mesophyll tissue, and they're going to make up this organ called a leaf. So an organ is two or more types of tissues coordinating and communicating together. And if I have several organs working together for a common purpose, that is, of course, an organ system. OK, so, for example, here I have the digestive system, which is our esophagus and our stomach and our small intestine and our large intestine. And then not to forget the pancreas and the gallbladder and the liver. All of these are organs working together, and that is called an organ system. And of course, an organism is all of those different organ systems working together, okay? So a single living thing made up of the different organ systems. Humans, for example, have 11 organ systems. The way that organ systems work together is a great example of an emergent property. Now, emergent properties are something that only multicellular organisms can have, okay? And it's basically something like, multiple things working together can accomplish more than they can accomplish singularly on their own. So I think of it as kind of like an airplane. Yeah, wings are cool and uh, a seat is cool and an engine is cool, but together on their own, they can't really do much. When you put them together, you can accomplish something really awesome. Same thing here with our body systems. To truly have integration, you must have two things. You must have communication and you must have transport of materials. So this is how organ systems will integrate or coordinate their actions together. So when we say communication, that can happen in a couple of different modes, right? So that can be either they're communicating through hormones or communicating through nervous signaling. And then they also must transport materials. So that might be transport through the blood or through the lymph, or if you're a plant, through the xylem or phloem, or a variety of ways here. But when we're thinking about coordination and integration, we must, must, must fulfill these requirements of communication and transport. Now, one way that organs or tissues or organ systems can communicate with one another are through hormones. And hormones are chemicals. They're produced by endocrine glands. Um, if you ever heard of that, that's the connection there. And they travel through the bloodstream. And that's going to be a really important distinction when we think about how other chemicals um, make its way through that communication cycle. So they travel through the bloodstream to the whole body. So why is it that they only affect certain cells. 
Well, that's because only certain cells have a receptor to fit that hormone, and those cells are called target cells. So um, a cell can come in contact with that hormone and do not have any effects if it doesn't have the right receptor protein. Now, hormonal communication lasts a long time, okay? So those hormones can last a long time until they're broken down, but because they're going through the blood, they are going to be quite a bit slower than some of the other mechanisms, especially through our nervous system. And that's because our nervous system isn't relying on blood, it's relying on electrical impulses. And those electrical impulses can move upwards of 100 meters per second, and that's really fast, okay? So they can be transmitted by neurons to very specific locations. So unlike hormones that are kind of distributed everywhere in our blood, these are going to a specific spot. And so they can affect muscles, or they can affect glands, or they can affect a specific muscle or specific gland. And so that's a really important distinguishing feature between nerve and hormone communication. They are very, very rapid. That means fast um, transmission methods. And they also last for only for a very short time. Okay. So rapid and fast um, and short compared to that long, slow acting action of hormones. So communication is one component of integration, transport is the other. And when we think of transport, we want to be thinking not only of materials, but also transport of energy is very important as well. There are lots of modes of transport, maybe the um, blood and circulatory system being the most um, easy example to visualize here, that our blood is literally carrying things from one part of our body um, to the next, okay? So the cardiovascular system isn't the only system that transports things. Some things like the digestive system are also transporting things. If I think about the food being transported from my esophagus down to my stomach, that's an example of transport transport. But again, we want to be thinking about how different materials or energy make it from one part of our body to the other or between one system and the next. Now, let's say I place my hand on something really hot and it hurts, okay? My normal like automatic response is going to be to move my hand away from that heat source. And that seems really simple, but there's actually a lot going on there. So our brain is the organ that's responsible for both processing information and causing a response. So the brain is going to receive information from sensory organs. So this information that's coming along from sensory sensory organs could be, ouch, that's hot. Ooh, that smells good. Ah, this time of day, I'm normally hungry. Or I like that shirt, something, okay? So some kind of sensory information from one of our sensory organs. The brain is going to do two things. It's going to process process that information and possibly store it for when it might need that information again. If the brain feels like a response is necessary, then it's going to send signals along um, motor neurons to effector organs. So effector organs could be a muscle, right? So my brain might tell the muscles of my hand, get out of there, that's hot, okay? Or it could be a gland like, oh, your eyes are feeling dry, you're going to need to produce tears from your tear ducts or sweat from your sweat glands, something like that. So the brain is what is taking all the information from our sensory organ um, organs, processing, prioritizing, storing, and then sending um, messages to effector organs if a response is required. Now, both the brain and the spinal cord make up a part of our nervous system called the central nervous system, or CNS. And that CNS isn't just the brain, the brain's important, (laughs) but also the spinal cord. So we don't want to forget about that. These are going to be our major processing centers when it comes to information. Now, extending outwardly from that brain or spinal cord from that CNS is our set of nerves, okay? So some people refer to this is our peripheral nervous system going to its outside. We'll talk about them in just in terms of the word nerves. So again, those are all the things that are um, extending to the central nervous system, like taking information there and then also taking information away from there. But that nerve system here um, is going to have a slightly different function from the CNS or central nervous system.
Now let's talk a little bit about the spinal cord. That's part of the central nervous system. And if I just take a slice out of the spinal cord and I flip it over on its side, I'm going to see two distinct regions. I'm going to see a region in the middle filled with a darker substance that's called gray matter and then surrounded by white matter on the outside. The white matter and the gray matter have distinct functions. So the white matter is going to be this transmission center. So it's going to be either receiving transmissions from sensory receptors, or it is going to be, to be transmitting them um, to the brain or to other organs. So this is kind of just a, I don't know, a transportation post for neural signaling. The gray matter is more for processing. So there are some functions that just need to happen very rapidly and it would take too long for those messages to go to the brain, be processed and come back. So there is a processing center in the spinal cord. It's in that gray matter and it acts a lot in the same way that a brain does. So it contains the cell bodies and synapses of some of these neurons and it's involved in processing and decision making for unconscious processes. So we can think of like involuntary muscle actions, let's say in our digestive something, digestive system, something like that. Okay. So two different distinct areas with two very different functions. And let's expand upon what kind of messages our spinal cord and our brain are going to be receiving. They're getting information coming in through what's called a sensory receptor. So a sensory receptor is going to gather information, send that information along a sensory neuron to either the brain or the spinal cord. So different sensory receptors, they could be external, right? So like touch, that's going to be like oh, maybe on your skin. We have heat receptors and we have light receptors. And then we also have internal sensory receptors. So this can be something like a stretch receptor. So like my stomach has a stretch receptor and that's how I know when I'm getting full or a chemoreceptor. So chemoreceptors are going to sense things like pH and it will tell me if there's too much uh, carbon dioxide in my blood. But these types of receptors, again, are collecting sensory information and then sending them along a sensory neuron to either our brain or our spinal cord. It's the job of our brain and spinal cord to process this information and see if some kind of action is required. If an action is required, then the brain or spinal cord is going to send a message along a motor neuron to an effector organ. So again, that could be a muscle, it could be a gland, okay? And so the point here is that all of these nervous messages are one-way signals. So I'm going to need different uh, neurons that carry information away from the central nervous system. Um, and those, again, have to be separate than the ones carrying information towards there. So we want to take a look at the output from cerebral hemispheres to muscles through motor neurons. So let's just back up for a moment and take a look at the brain. The brain is going to be made of several distinct regions with different functions, and we're looking specifically at motor neurons, and we'll zoom into that in just a second. Now, different parts of the brain affect different organs via these motor neurons. And what's really interesting about these motor neurons is that even though they may have um, cell bodies located very close to one another, their axons and their terminals may go to very different places. So it's important to remember that if you remove a small portion of the brain, it may be very hard hard to predict what the consequence will be because although, again, these neurons originate in a nearby spot, their axons and their terminals may lead to different places. Let's take, for example, this very small, well, small looking section of our brain called the motor cortex. So it looks like it is a very, very small slice. How important can it be? 
very important. This happens to be a section of the brain that contains the origin of a lot of our motor neurons. So what does that mean? That means that these motor neurons all have their cell bodies, the beginning of those neurons originating, originating in this part of the brain, but they extend to very different parts of our body. So some are going to extend to our knee and others, again, those neurons are all originating nearby, but might extend extend to our elbow or might extend to our tongue or might extend to our thumb. So again, all of these neurons originate in this one tiny section of the brain, but then their axons and um, axon terminals are going to extend and affect very different parts of our body. Now remember, neurons can only transmit messages in one way. So I'm gonna need sensory neurons taking information to the central nervous system, and then also motor neurons extending outwardly from the central nervous system. So these are two different neurons, and I'm going to find both of them contained within a nerve. So a nerve is a bundle of nerve fibers that is surrounded by a sheath. So here I'm looking at a nerve. These have have names like sciatic nerve and axillary nerve and cranial nerves. Remember, nerves aren't just one neuron. They contain several types of neurons. So they'll have sensory neurons that are carrying information to the brain. They will have motor neurons carrying information from the brain, okay, because they can only move um, messages in one direction. Now we'll talk about an example of neural signaling. So this is the pain reflex arc, okay? And a reflex arc is involuntary and it's very fast. So that means you have no control over this happening. It's a very rapid response to a specific stimulus. So that stimulus is going to be picked up on by a receptor. This receptor can be touch, heat, light, smell, one of our senses. So in this case, I don't know, I'm gonna think about a piece of dust or an object flying into my eyeball and that is painful. That pain message is carried along a sensory neuron. Okay, so sensory neurons carry things towards the central nervous system. Once it gets to the central nervous system, whether that is the brain or the spinal cord, um, that is going to be passed along what we call an interneuron. Inter means between. So interneurons are neurons that go between a sensory neuron and a motor neuron. So once that sensory input reaches the central nervous system, some processing is done by the interneuron, and then a message starts to be transmitted along a motor neuron, and those go away from the central nervous system towards effector organs. In this case, in the pain reflex arc, the effector organs are going to be skeletal muscles. So we would expect them to initiate some kind of movement. And in this case, the movement is probably going to be to close that eyelid, right? So this is an example of how nerves and skeletal muscles integrate. Now, earlier we talked about that motor cortex, that area right in here that can control our skeletal muscles but it's not the only thing. Guys, the brain is super complicated. So in this section, we'll take a look at the role of a part of the brain called the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is right here. It's kind of in the back over here, the bottom of your brain. And this is gonna be the coordination center. We talked about how important coordination is for the integration of our body systems. And so what this is going to do is it's going to coordinate the timing of muscle contractions. So if I need muscle contractions in multiple parts of my body to happen at, you know, you know, coordinated times, it's the job of that cerebellum to coordinate all of those muscle contractions. Okay, so this is going to be how things like balance work. When I balance, I have to, you know, control muscles in my core and in my legs. Same thing here with posture, like in your back, or things that require muscle memory. So when I go out ice skating, I don't have to think every time, move your leg, move your foot, move your core. I don't have to think 
about that, I have that muscle memory. That's all due to the coordination center in this part of our brain called the cerebellum. And again, this is all about um, integration and within theme, the, uh, theme C, that interdependence. And so we really want to think of the brain as a great example of that interaction and interdependence.